I'm ITV's Judge Rinder. I've been a criminal barrister for over a decade. I'm going to be examining cases that have shocked the nation. 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 On today's episode... Two 15-year-old girls are murdered three years apart. The police are positive that the same man was responsible. We were convinced that whoever had murdered one girl had murdered the other. To find the killer, the police attempt something never done before. Nobody had ever attempted this sort of analysis. The result stunned us. Can they catch the killer before he strikes again? This is Judge Rinder's crime story. Anybody who's ever watched police drama will, of course, know about DNA evidence. After all, it's been used as a tool by detectives for many years now. But who first made the crucial breakthrough in this science? And how did police solve a crime so violent that it would go on to shock and devastate two local communities and change the entire world of criminal investigation forever? This is the case of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. Leicester, a vibrant city in the East Midlands. On the outskirts is the village of Narborough. In 1983, this was a quiet suburban location, the perfect setting to raise a family. Rebecca Eastwood, the sister of Linda Mann, remembers it fondly. Narborough village was a very quiet little village. It's one of those villages where everybody knows everybody and everyone's friends. You know, you could leave your doors unlocked. You wouldn't have to worry about your car. The kids can go and play out on the streets. Rebecca was the youngest of three sisters. Linda was a middle child in the family. Although very young in 1983, Rebecca has fond memories of her sister. She was a bright girl. She loved school. She had a lot of really close friends. She was very quiet. She used to babysit for the local parents. She loved making her own clothes. She was quite aspired to become something great, and I think she would have definitely carried on and maybe even gone into fashion, probably, because she enjoyed it so much. On the night of the 21st of November, 1983, Linda left home to babysit for one of the local families. Nobody knew that this would be the last time they would see her alive. Our parents had gone out for the night, and my older sister was looking after me at home. Linda was on her way back home when she'd finished doing a babysitting and she took a shortcut through what we call the black pad because it was um, a little alleyway, it's very dark, but it was the quickest route back home. Linda had walked this area many times and had no reason to be wary. Martin Ballard, a local BBC radio journalist, covered the case and knows the area well. The black pad is a cut through, really, and fairly remote. It was unfortunate for Linda that on that occasion, she happened to be there at the wrong time. That night, totally against character, Linda did not return home. My mum and dad were out looking for her, shouting her name. Neighbours were out looking for her, but nobody could find her. So obviously the police were then informed and a massive search came about. David Baker, a detective chief superintendent with Leicestershire Constabulary, was a senior investigating officer on the case. Linda Mann had been reported missing by her parents the previous evening. It was fairly late at night, I think after 10 o'clock, when they reported it, and a search was made as much as possible, bearing in the mind that it was dark and nobody was about anywhere, so there was very few inquiries that they could make. However, Early the next morning, a horrendous discovery was made. She was found on the field at the side of the black pad where she took the shortcut, which was only literally just down the road from where we lived. But obviously, when everyone was out looking, it was pitch black dark, and um, obviously couldn't see her at the time. I got the call early in the morning to say that uh, the body had been found uh, on a footpath by an ambulance driver who was cycling to work. Police obviously then, once they found her, come back to tell my parents that they'd unfortunately found her. Despite being young at the time, 
Rebecca told us about the effect this had on her mother. She was heartbroken and everyone was just devastated. News of the death of this innocent young girl quickly rippled through the community. Alan Johnson was a journalist with the Leicester Mercury at the time. Murder was not commonplace in that part of Leicestershire. People would generally know their neighbours. There were parish council meetings, there were village halls, there were all sorts of things which drew people together as part of that community. All that changed after that November when Linda's body was found. David Baker took charge of the investigation and began the hunt for Linda's killer. The post-mortem revealed that Linda had been uh, strangled and, in fact, had been raped. We were able to obtain samples which indicated that her assailant was Group A and uh, a PGM-1 secretor. And that was basically the only forensic evidence we obtained from the scene. A PGM-1 secretor is a person whose blood type can be identified by analysing their bodily fluids. Approximately 12.9% of the male population is a type A PGM-1 secretor. It was essential that we kept the public on side, and so we used media, radio, TV, newspapers to keep the inquiry alive as long as we could. The sudden and brutal murder of Linda Mann sent shockwaves through the entire community. There was an immediate public outcry and a fear, a real fear. I've spoken to parents who were in the area at the time who were afraid to let their teenage daughters or sons, for that matter, uh, go out alone after dark. It changed their lives, really, overnight, and everything they did changed. Due to the location of the crime, people began to think that the killer must have known the area. I think the village was quite stunned by what had happened. There was every possibility that the person responsible for the death was a, a local. Emma Kenny is a psychologist who has studied the case. The idea that this killer was a local man, to imagine when you're walking down the street that he's passing you, or it could be your postman, the guy who delivers your milk, the person who serves you at your local shop, the person who teaches your children, everybody is a suspect. And that's what makes this really scary, because suddenly a world that you trusted becomes a place full of strangers. The police used every resource available to try and catch the person who did this. However, with no witnesses and very little evidence, the killer remained at large. Initially, with Linda Mann, you know, there was an awful lot of, of activity, lots of door-to-door uh, -door inquiries and so on. Um, it was over a period of time that the police were starting to run out of, of leads to follow. Again, because the time was very different, there were no sightings of Linda, there were no cameras anywhere, not a lot of people about. So the police started to run out of ideas by their own admission. They did start to give up hope, the police, and they were starting to feel that there were no more leads to follow. It was frustrating, but there was no information coming in and there was very little that we could do except just try and keep the inquiry alive using the media. As time passed, the search for Linda Mann's killer slowed down. Three years later, in July 1986, a young girl in the neighboring village of Enderby was going to visit a friend in Narborough. She was reported missing by her family to the police. We were informed and started uh, a search for her as a missing person. The police concentrated their search on where Dawn Ashworth was last seen. Two days later, they made a horrific discovery. She had been raped and murdered and the body secreted. And then we started a full-scale murder inquiry. News quickly spread throughout the area of this brutal murder of an innocent child. People immediately began to draw comparisons to Linda Mann three years earlier. For the family, when Dawn was killed, it was terrifying. And that was like a second 
ripple of fear for the whole village. All the neighbours, the villagers around, everyone was terrified that this man was out there killing young girls. Was the same man responsible for both of these murders? The comparisons, however chilling, could not be ignored. They were both 15, both beautiful, both had dark hair, obviously both going to school, and both just unfortunately in the wrong place at the wrong time. We certainly put the two murders of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth together, and it's probably being committed by the same person. And we also established that on the body of Dawn, there was French examples which led us to believe that the um, offender was also of Group A and a PGM1 secretor. So we had got a certain amount of forensic evidence which connected the two. But of course, it didn't give us any other information. Around the time that Dawn's body was found by police, a young man by the name of Richard Buckland was seen by police close to the location. He seemed to be taking an interest in the investigation, which caused the police to be suspicious. Buckland worked as a kitchen porter at the nearby Carlton Hayes Hospital. He was in the area, he was questioned by police, and under questioning, he made certain admissions that tied him to the crime scene. It was at that time that the police, when questioning, also asked him about the Linda Mann murder, which he denied any knowledge of. We were convinced that whoever had murdered one girl had murdered the other. The examination of, of his um, blood at that time revealed that he was of Group A and he was also a PGM1 secretor. So in consequence of all the evidence that we had against him, he was charged and put before the court and remanded in custody. Police now had to prove that Richard Buckland had killed both the girls. We felt that there was a likelihood of there being a further victim. What happened next would change the entire world of criminal investigations. Nobody had ever attempted this sort of analysis. The result stunned us. Leicester, 1986. Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth, two 15-year-old girls brutally murdered. The police have 17-year-old Richard Buckland in custody and are building a case against him. Police were certain that the same man had killed both women. We continued to believe that he was involved in the murder of Linda Mann but despite questioning, there was no other evidence to connect him with it. And of course, the blood grouping that we had fitted quite a lot of people. Dave Baker had read an article in the Leicester Mercury about Alec Jeffries having used genetic fingerprinting in paternity cases, immigration cases and so on, and suddenly realised he may be able to apply those techniques to this murder investigation. Professor Alec Jeffries was a lecturer specialising in genetics at the University of Leicester. I was contacted by a member of David Baker's team and they basically said that you know, we've heard about this DNA testing that you're doing. Um, we have a, a really quite a major investigation on the go here in Leicester involving the rape and murder of two young schoolgirls. Is there anything you can do to help? Without hesitation, I, I said, we will try. Professor Alec Jeffries began working on the investigation he was tasked with the job of proving that Richard Buckland was the killer. Nobody had ever attempted this sort of analysis on real old forensic samples. There's one thing doing it on a pristine blood sample. It's a wholly different issue of taking old, potentially contaminated samples and trying to get something sensible out of it. 
Key samples arrived, both crime scene samples and blood sample from the prime suspect, a young man who had confessed in the presence of his lawyer to the second murder. It was almost like the whole temperature of the laboratory dropped by about 30 degrees. This was chilling. Here we were dealing with, with samples from two truly dreadful local crimes, absolutely awful. My job, from the police's perspective, was pretty straightforward. Prove the DNA link with respect to the second murder and try and tie him into the first murder. This was the first time that DNA science had been applied in a criminal case. There was absolutely no guarantee that the science would work. Well, this was a big leap of faith from David Baker, but such was his confidence that Buckland was the killer, all he needed was the proof. It was just, you know, like um, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, and the case will go to court, and that will be the end of it. They weren't looking into any other lines of inquiry or any other uh, pursuit of evidence. This was the done deal. The tests were carried out. However, the results were not what David Baker and his team were expecting. We looked at the results, and that was a shock. What we could see was the semen DNA profile that was recovered from both victims had what appeared to be the same DNA profile. Very strong evidence that the police were right, that both girls had been raped and presumably murdered by the same man. Then we looked at the prime suspect. These are the actual DNA results obtained by Alec Jeffries. So here is this man's blood DNA profile here and here. Completely different from the semen DNA profile. A total mismatch. The young man who confessed to the second murder was not the guilty party. False confession. So the first time that DNA was ever used in a criminal investigation was not to prove guilt, but was to prove innocence. A press conference was called, and David Baker then had to make the announcement to everybody uh, gathered there, the media and some members of the local community, that this man was indeed not the killer. The result stunned us, but of course it also invigorated us in the fact that um, he was able to say quite categorically and demonstrate it that one man was responsible for both murders. And of course that um, really caused us grave concern in the fact that we needed to go on further because we felt that there was a likelihood of there being a further victim. The police had the wrong man in custody. Richard Buckland's admissions were proved to be false and he was released immediately with no charges brought against him. The killer of the two young women was still roaming the streets. However, the police now had his DNA. Could they catch him before he struck again? At that time, David Baker decided that because there were no other lines of inquiry, that they would try to test every man in those three villages because they were absolutely convinced the murderer came from Narborough, Littlethorpe or Enderby. If you've got the DNA fingerprint of the guilty person, then you've got the basis for launching a manhunt. So what he initiated was, in fact, the world's very first DNA-based manhunt. It was new, it was revolutionary, it was the greatest move in crime detection since fingerprinting was uh, discovered 100 years ago. Police began taking blood samples from every young man in the area. We had built into the system several fail-safes because we were aware there was a possibility that uh, somebody could take the samples on behalf of somebody else. They were asked to bring some form of identification, passport, driving license, or what have you. And if they hadn't got that, then we were prepared to take photographs and uh, go and visit neighbours and establish firmly their identity. Police continued testing and analysing the DNA of over 5,000 men from the three villages. None of the samples taken match the DNA of the killer. There were a lot of people questioning whether or not the scientific process was all that it was cracked up to be. Alec Jeffries 
was obviously a defiant. David Baker still believed in it, but they just couldn't understand. And it was frustrating for everybody. And I can only imagine what the two families felt like as well, because they were hoping for that closure that never came. Then something happened that nobody could have predicted. An overheard conversation in a pub suddenly changed the entire investigation. A man was talking to his friend about a DNA test that he'd taken for someone else. He was overheard by uh, a woman who was very concerned by what she'd heard because it meant that somebody had got away with giving a test and why would somebody want to get away with giving a test unless they had a good reason for not wanting to be discovered. And she contacted Leicestershire Police. Police questioned the man and he explained that he had taken the test for someone else, Colin Pitchfork. Pitchfork had persuaded him that he had taken a blood sample for somebody else who was frightened to go, and he couldn't go again himself, so would he go for him? So he'd agreed, and Pitchfork had then doctored his passport, inserting his photograph in it, which he then presented at the blood sampling session. That's when, obviously, the no blood samples matched the DNA that they had. Colin Pitchfork must have thought he was a free man from there. Police knew that they had to act quickly. They went to the home that Colin Pitchfork shared with his wife and children and arrested him straight away. Colin Pitchfork complied with the arresting officers and went quietly. He knew his game was up. We arrested Pitchfork, and Pitchfork, on his arrest, admitted the murder of both girls. I think the pressure had been on him, and he was really expecting us. People were in disbelief that this family man who had lived and worked in the area was responsible for the murder of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. A lot of people knew him through his work. I think there were a lot of people who couldn't believe that it was him. But with that scientific evidence, it's irrefutable. In Leicester Crown Court, on the 22nd of January, 1988, Colin Pitchfork pleaded guilty to the rape and murder of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. During the court proceedings, the true horror of what he had done was explained to the judge. The majority of this is not suitable for this programme. He was driving around with a young child in the car, trying to get the child to sleep. He was driving past where the black pad is, and he saw Linda walking up there and just pulled over and took his opportunity. Psychopaths like Colin Pitchfork are very easily able to carry out normal responsibilities and activities whilst also at the same time committing heinous crimes. It actually makes sense that his child would be sleeping in his car whilst he was raping and strangling a child because there's nothing exceptional about that behaviour. It's just part of what he is and part of what he wants. In his sentencing remarks, the judge said that the rapes and murders were of a particularly sadistic kind. He further pointed out that had it not been for the use of scientific means, of detection known as DNA fingerprinting, you still might have been at large today, and other young women would have been prey to your actions. Colin Pitchfork was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum tariff of 30 years. This was amended in 2009 to a minimum of 28 years. Women jeered and chanted abuse as he was driven away. History will look back and say, yes, this was a pretty significant case. This started a whole new sort of dimension to forensic investigations. I feel desperately, desperately sorry for the, the families of, of Dawn Ashworth and Linda Mann. I want the girls, Linda and Dawn, to be remembered 
that their lives were taken for this process to become what is just a standard form of elimination in crime these days, rather than just the victims of Colin Pitchfork. Colin Pitchfork was given a life sentence and told to serve a minimum of 30 years. This was subsequently amended in 2009 to a minimum of 28 years. When sentencing Pitchfork, the judge remarked that his crimes were of a particularly sadistic kind. He also pointed out that had it not been for the use of DNA fingerprinting, that Pitchfork might still be at large today. I've received a letter from the mother of Dawn Ashworth. There are no words to convey what it's like to lose a child, especially in such a cruel manner. I had a boy and a girl, every blessing. And when my daughter Dawn was taken, something inside of me died. My feelings in cases like this, where there isn't a shred of evidence over guilt, are that life should be life. Parole shouldn't even be a consideration. Why should Pitchfork be given the chance to pick up the pieces of his life? On taking Dawn's life, he denied all she had to live for. My suffering and heartache continue, as DNA is mentioned daily, and has done so for the past 30 years, whether through real-life cases or even TV dramas. I'm immediately taken back to those nightmare times, and so my life sentence goes on. The DNA research undertaken by Alec Jeffries that was used in this investigation has had a profound effect on the world that we live in today. Countless lives have been affected by the work that was done in Leicester at that time. It's hard to imagine a world these days without the scientific breakthrough made by Alec Jeffries and his team. DNA evidence is the bedrock for nearly all criminal investigations and is used throughout the world in cases from theft to international terrorism. As a result of this work, which began at Leicester University, literally millions of criminals who would otherwise have avoided detection have now faced the full weight of the law. After the break, an evening run turns into tragedy as a man carrying a deadly cargo leaves two women fighting for their lives. All I saw in front of me was a pair of headlights. There was no time to react whatsoever. Immediately, I thought, car crash. I could see Dave, but I couldn't see the girls. When two friends, Laura and Jess, who, like a number of people, took an evening jog with their local running club, they could not have known that they would fall prey to a drug dealer driving at speed whilst carrying his illegal cargo. Bolton, a bustling town in Greater Manchester, close to the West Pennine Moors. Laura Hodgson was born in Tenerife. However, Bolton has always been her home since the age of two. Her best friend is Jess Salmon. She has fond memories of meeting Jess and all of the times that they've shared together. I met Jess in college six or seven years that we've been friends. Went on college nights out together, started going to gigs together, continued three when Jess went to university, I used to go visit her. And then when she returned home, we just became best friends. Also living in Bolton was a 22-year-old male law student. He didn't know Laura and Jess. He made his money by transporting lethal packages around the city. Jess, like many other people in the UK, decided to take up running as a hobby and to improve her fitness. Jess joined her local running group and quickly began making friends. Gillian McGowan joined the group at the same time and took an instant liking to Jess. I run for Burnden Road Runners, and um, she started in the New Starters group um, at the same time as I did. She's a sweet girl, lovely personality, very gentle, very pretty girl. 
I have got quite close to Jess. Although both begins to running, Gillian and Jess both fell in love with it and soon were regulars at the club. And after that, they were taking part in events, both locally and abroad. We've done lots of running together. We even went to do the Malta Half Marathon in February. We did get quite friendly, Jess and myself. Lauren knew that Jess had found a passion for running and was supportive of her friend. I knew that she used to go running every Monday and she used to compete in park runs on Saturdays. On some weeks, she would do multiple runs. I know that recently, before the run, she did a half marathon and she really enjoyed that. That was something that she loved to do. Laura told Jess that she wanted to get fit and Jess suggested that she try running with her friend at the club. I'd signed up for Tough Mudder, which was happening later on in the year. Therefore, I'd need to do some training prior to that because I'd heard that it was quite a difficult course. Monday the 7th of March 2016. Jess invited her best friend Laura to take part in one of her club's organised runs. While Jess and Laura were preparing for their run, another resident of Bolton had something very different in mind for the evening. His world would soon collide with theirs. David Pearson, one of the club's more experienced runners, remembers that night well. We all met up at Smithles Sports Centre in Bolton, where various groups uh, were organised, depending on ability. Jessica asked me which route we were taking because a friend hadn't turned up and she wanted her to run with her. I had not met Laura before, and it was Laura that she was waiting for. A man who had no business being in charge of a vehicle was on the roads of Bolton that night. Laura, Jess and the group set off running in high spirits. All of that was about to change. There was lighting all along the road, so there wasn't any difficulty seeing where we were going. And because we were with the group, there was people ahead and people behind us as well that were all running. It was easy to follow the route of the run because I was just following the person in front. It was just a normal uh, Monday evening run, you know, having what we call a bit of fun, really. But there was nothing normal about this night. It wasn't just the running club that were on the streets of Bolton. The man in the vehicle was fast approaching the runners. His motive? To deliver an extremely dangerous substance. We crossed over at the top of Moss Bank Way Road. We're continuing to run down. That was like the final stretch. I thought, I've managed to get through this. Then, out of nowhere, a car travelling at speed left the road and hit Laura and Jess head on. The rest of the group could do nothing but look on in horror. Jess and Laura had been hit by a car travelling at speed. Nobody knew how severe they had been hurt or that the driver was a courier for a gang of drug dealers. She was screaming, lay on the floor. All she kept saying was, please don't leave me, please don't leave me. I can't see a friend anywhere. She could be under that car. Something's not right here. There's a lot of police around. We all knew that it was him. March 2016, Jess and Laura were two friends out with their local running club and had nearly completed a five-mile run as they were just approaching the final section. Tragedy struck. There was this almighty crash. Immediately, I thought, car crash. I turned round and a car was on its roof sliding along the road. I could hear screams. I could see Dave but I couldn't see the girls, couldn't see Jess and Laura. As I got closer, I could see somebody was laying on the floor, the side of the car, and I got closer still, I realised it was Jessica. We were 
was still on the pavement. I was on the inside of the road. Jess was on the outside of me. Within seconds, all I saw in front of me was a pair of headlights. There was no time to react whatsoever. I got hit by the car on my right-hand side. My body went onto the bonnet. My head hit the windscreen. I then got flung backwards. My immediate thought was Jessica. She was screaming, lay on the floor. Paul Copley, a member of a mountain rescue team, just happened to be passing by at the time of the accident. Pulled the car over, jumped out and ran across the road. Could hear this almighty screaming. Found this, uh, the girl, which I now know is to be Jessica, uh, lying on the floor, knelt down next to Jessica, asked her was she in the car. To my surprise, she said no. So obviously then I know she's been hit and she's been thrown quite a, a distance. Could see the huge hematoma on the head. Could see her leg was a mess. Uh, obviously she's in an awful lot of pain. Tried to reassure her. She was, she was squeezing my hand tight. All she kept saying was, please don't leave me, please don't leave me. Jess then asked Paul a question that caused him to panic. Jessica said, where's my friend? Utter panic for me, because then I'm looking at Jessica and I'm looking around and I think, I can't see a friend anywhere. Looked at the car, the car's on its roof. Unlikely, but not impossible that she could be under that car. A lady came out of one of the houses and said, there's a lady in my garden. And then it dawned on me that the other lady was Jessica's friend. She'd been catapulted approximately 10 foot. She just said, I just can't move my knees. I can't strengthen my legs. So I, I immediately thought that both her legs had been broken. The severity of the impact caused the girls to be thrown in different directions. Paul Copley found Laura and immediately began to help her. When I got to Laura, she was quite the opposite of Jessica. She was very quiet which, for me, is not good. Because when I'm thinking, is there anything going on? Is there an airway? Is she conscious? And she was conscious. I've never been in pain like that in, in my life so far. So my initial thought was that I'd either broke both my legs or that I'd done something to my spine. Paul then approached and said, I work for Mountain Rescue. Um, I'm just going to come round and make sure that you don't move any parts. He said, just stay still. And then he ended up holding my head in position. Um, almost like a brace. Her initial conversation with me was, I have the bones sticking through my legs. She felt as though her bones were coming through her legs, her shins. She, that's what she felt. So I had her run my hands down and assured her that no bones were protruding. She had no compound fractures. Paul remained with Laura, ensuring she was in a stable condition until the paramedics arrived. From their location, they could hear the terrible screams coming from Jess. She was in an awful lot of pain. Jessica's cries went right through you. I think Laura found that upsetting because she could hear Jessica screaming. It must have been upsetting for her on top of worrying about herself. Whilst Laura and Jessica were being treated, attention then turned to the driver of the vehicle. The driver got out of the car and tried to run off, but the neighbours saw him and brought him back to the pavement side. And he was trying to say that he wasn't driving, that somebody else had been driving and that they'd run off. But we all knew that it was him. There was only him. The driver was Mohammed Kwazim, a 22-year-old student. Nobody yet knew why he was attempting to leave the scene or claim that he was a passenger and not the driver. People were saying, keep an eye on him. I do remember that. And I do remember people saying to him, stay there. I think a couple of guys off the houses were sort of a minder role, if you like. They were keeping an eye on him. He was taken by the police from the scene of the accident to the hospital. Jess suffered horrific injuries to her leg and head. Miraculously, she survived. 
I just remember being lay there and being in so much pain. Even though I'd had pain relief while the ambulance was there looking after me, it just wasn't enough for the kind of pain I was going through. Jess and Laura were now on their way to hospital. Nobody yet knew the extent of the damage done to both girls. It was obvious, however, that the damage Jess had suffered to her leg was catastrophic. Despite Jess being in agony, her main concern was the welfare of Laura. I was asking, where's Laura? Where is she? Is she all right? And then I was getting upset because I wanted to see her. After arriving at hospital, Jess was taken to the operating theater where they began surgery in an attempt to save her leg. My surgeon said to me, you're either going to have a frame fitted, which is external, or you're going to have plates fitted, because all the bone was shattered in so many pieces. The damage to Jess's leg was so severe that she was in the operating theater for 11 hours. The surgeon had no choice but to fit an Elizarov frame to her leg. All these pins in my leg are just holding them all together. And I've got permanent screws and pins in my knee holding that together as well, because that was just shattered. By this time, it was uncertain how long the frame would be on her leg, or whether she'd really ever be able fully to recover. But her leg was not the only injury that she suffered that night. I had a broken nose. I found myself with a glued cut in the back of my head. I had two broken ribs and I had broken my front two teeth. Laura was lucky to have escaped the accident with superficial injuries to the head and damage to her leg. I'd overstretched the cartilage in my knee. I'd broken a bone within my knee as well. Mohammed Kwasim was taken to the same hospital as Laura and Jess. Whilst Laura was receiving treatment, her mother noticed unusual activity in the hospital. My mum said, it's something's not right here. There's a lot of police around. It wouldn't warrant that many police to, to be there if it was just a genuine accident. It wasn't until the next day when Laura saw Jess for the first time since the accident that she began to learn the truth about what had happened. It was at that point that her dad or her mum had said, well, the police are questioning him because he, he, he's found drugs in the vehicle. He's been charged on possession of drugs. On the night in question, the driver was delivering drugs. So he was drug running. On searching the vehicle, police found heroin with a street value of over 500 pounds in the footwell. I was kind of just shocked that he was involved in something like that. When you're 22. You're meant to be going to university to study law. What are you doing carrying, you know, drugs around? Further investigation found that Mohammed Kasim was already banned from driving. The police had said that he was approximately travelling at 55 miles per hour. This is the actual CCTV footage of the incident. They can't be accurate because he didn't actually break. He just went right into us. I do feel extremely, extremely lucky that I wasn't killed. And the fact that it was just one leg, could have been two, could have been my back, could have been my head. On the 17th of May, 2016, he appeared in Bolton Crown Court and he pleaded guilty to charges of causing serious injury by dangerous driving, driving whilst disqualified, and possession of heroin with intent to supply. As his barrister was reading the note of apology out, he actually looked directly at me and Jess and nodded as if to say, I really mean that, which made me feel a little bit uncomfortable at first, but at the end of the day, you're both human beings, so he knows he's done wrong. He's going to be punished for that. In my statement, I said we were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the judge actually said, no, you were in the right place. He was in the wrong place. And he shouldn't have been doing anything that he was doing. After entering his guilty plea, Mohammed Kassim was given a custodial sentence 
of 54 months. Laura and Jess have remained the best of friends since the accident. They both feel lucky to be alive. I do feel like this is a second chance in life, as, uh, as soppy as that sounds, but I do feel like I've got to do everything I wanted to do. Since then, I haven't, I haven't done any road running. The only time that I did sort of do some jogging was during the Tough Mudder event, which I was determined still to do anyway. And I did it, yeah, I finished it. It was a great day, actually, really good. Despite still wearing the frame on her leg following the accident, Jess is positive that one day she'll run again. I am going to run again. Quite like to do a half marathon and raise some money for Bowel Cancer UK. I think it'll take me a while to get back to running on the roads, but we'll see how it goes. Jess and Laura's bravery was extraordinary. And of course, they were lucky that they didn't lose their lives back in March 2016. Going for a run should, of course, not have placed them in the path of a courier who should never have been on the road in the first place. But it's not only Jess and Laura who had a lucky escape that night. The arrest and conviction of Mohammed Kwasim stopped countless others from being put at risk from the sale and use of heroin that he was so adamant to deliver. Do you have a case to bring to my court? On Judge Rinder, there's a chance for you to have your legal case heard. Does someone owe you money? Are you desperate for a debt to be repaid? Let me settle your dispute and get you the justice you so richly deserve. If you're 18 or over and would like to be considered for the show, text the word judge plus your name to 6334. Text costs 25 pence plus one standard network rate message or call 090 1122 Calls cost 25 pence plus your network access charge or email judge at itv.com. Please note we are unable to consider claims that have been or are currently in court.